I went to Teddy Roosevelt's National Park last July, so I thought I'd visit his lake north of Phoenix while I was in the area. But first, I'd have to get out of the sprawling metropolis of Phoenix and head for Florence, which was the first place I headed every day but one. Getting a good footless stop is so satisfying, and this 10-year-old rental Triumph had excellent low-speed balance. Anyway, I think I'll have to stay here next time. It's much more interesting than any of the Phoenix suburbs I saw. The main street feels a little wild west, and there isn't a housing development in sight. There is a pretty substantial prison here, but all these wild burrows are being trained by inmates to make them more adoptable. The burrows, not the inmates. And while I don't agree with rounding up all the wild burrows and horses, this seems like a much better solution than euthanizing them because they were competing with cattle for resources. Now that we have all that out of the way, let's go wander around the desert. This is the Florence-Kelvin Highway that travels the desolate land between, well, Florence and Kelvin. About halfway there, the road turns to dirt, which was a welcome surprise. And as I approached Kelvin, I was treated to spectacular mountain views. just in front of those mountains are massive tailing piles, which belong to the Ray Mine, one of the largest copper reserves in the country. And it just seems to keep going, and going, and going, with Teapot Mountain hoping that it isn't next. As the mine disappears from view, Route 177 reveals itself as a beautiful, winding road. I hop on to Route 60 to climb up through Queen Creek Canyon. You can just see the old Queen Creek Bridge down below along with the original road that is now sadly only open to pedestrians and bicycles. This larger arch bridge will soon be a thing of the past as well, and they started work to replace it five days after I went through. This tunnel was finished in 1952 and replaced a much smaller tunnel that was built in the 20s that is still accessible on the old road. The tunnel spits you out into a land of towering cliffs and deep gorges. I had to stop and take a look. After seeing very explicit signs that motor vehicles aren't allowed on the old road, I continue along 60 under the towering stone pillars. I even found a little bit of Arizona snow on the side of the road. Welcome to Miami, but Will Smith isn't here and neither is South Beach. This one is a copper mining town that was founded in 1907, only seven years after the one in Florida was incorporated. You can still see the tops of the old mine elevators all along the hillside. They still mine copper here, but it all comes out of an open pit mine now. It looks like an interesting little town, but I'll have to save it for another time. Route 188 winds through the Gerald Hills. And past the Salt River Mountains on its way to Theodore Roosevelt Lake, which you can just see off in the distance. But before I got to the lake, I turned off to have a little wander around Tonto National Monument. Where they contracted the maker of Candy Dots to handle their speed bump needs. The cliff dwellings of Tonto National Monument were inhabited by the Salado people during the 13th, 14th, and early 15th centuries. You can visit the lower cliff dwelling anytime the park's open. So I started the half-mile walk up the concrete path. The buildings sit in a massive cave in the side of a hill. 
which has done a great job preserving the adobe structures. With increased tourist traffic, the CCC did some stabilization work in the 1930s. The people here had amazing views of the Salt River Basin. The lake wasn't here, but what a landscape to look out on while grinding the daily corn. On the way back down, I got to see a saguaro cactus skeleton and more beautiful views of Teddy Roosevelt Lake before getting one last glimpse of the cliff dwellings. There is a larger upper cliff dwelling, but it requires a reservation and guided tour to see. I was not that organized. Route 188 continues over Theodore Roosevelt Bridge, which passes over Theodore Roosevelt Lake, which is held back by Theodore Roosevelt Dam, which was opened by Teddy himself in 1911. It was the largest masonry dam in the world at the time. Now it is fully entombed in concrete. Just past the western end of the lake is El Oso Road, a mountain pass that climbs around 3,500 feet into the foothills of the Four Peaks. It's a recommended dual sport route on Butler Maps, and it seems to be reasonably popular in all segments of the off-roading community. Sorry, the off-pavementing community. That campsite sure has a nice view. This road isn't terribly challenging, but it's perfect for this bike. It winds its way through the hills, climbing in elevation the whole time. About halfway up is a roundabout perched on the edge of the steep slopes with excellent views of Teddy's Lake below and the ever imposing and snowy Brown's Peak. Not a bad place for a lunch stop at all. I suppose I shouldn't be that surprised to see snow up here. It is January after all, but I'm not used to riding with snow on the ground and being perfectly warm. nice to see some other motos out here instead of just jeeps and side-by-sides. I seem to have found a very north-facing slope, and the road goes right through it. Well, those bikes made it through. I'm sure it'll be fine. The outriggers have been fully deployed. The rear tire has very little grip, but if I keep the RPMs low and slip the clutch, it just works. No style points for that one, but I'll take it. That was exciting. Those antennas on top of the hill look quite a bit like the 60s antenna that was used to discover microwave background radiation throughout the universe. But these are probably just a relay station. I keep climbing for a little bit longer, but don't see any more big patches of snow. This marks the start of the journey back down. This side of the pass feels different. There are a lot more giant rocks lying around. Oh man, I haven't seen one of those in years. And it's so clean. All the ones on the east coast have rusted out by now.
I learned a new plant on this trip. All these bushy chartreuse plants are called desert broom. It is a pioneer species that quickly establishes itself in disturbed areas, like the side of the road. The rocks scattered around the hills are also embedded in the road, which means I heard quite a bit of chatter from the center stand. But who cares when you have desert views like these? A smooth road surface means I'm nearly back to civilization. El Oso Road was an excellent way to get from Theodore Roosevelt Lake back toward Phoenix. I hopped on the B-Line Highway for a short stretch in order to follow the Salt River, which is home to a band of wild horses. They live in Tonto National Forest and come down to the Salt River for water and to cool off in the hot summer months. They are likely descendants of the horses brought here by the Spanish explorers in the 16th century. Now what do you suppose they're testing? I think they're trying to see if they can just paint lines instead of make cattle guards. Save a ton of money. I didn't manage to find any horses down near the water here. I think they're more active around dawn and dusk. I did find a forest of teddy bear choya though. I saw a lot of these signs and had just about given up hope on seeing any horses when I spotted this guy off the main road near a wash. I kept my distance and he was more interested in whatever he was eating than me. When he did pick up his head, I messed up the focus. So enjoy one more photo of horse butt. I set off towards Mount McDowell and Arizona Dam Butte on the last stretch of desert back roads before riding back into the suburban sprawl of Phoenix to return the rental triumph to its owner. This was about a 200 mile loop of paved and easy dirt roads to the east of the Phoenix area, and it was a good fit for this Triumph 800 XC. If you're still here, thanks for coming along, and stay tuned for more moto content.